Larry Schofield. Since 2005, Larry has worked in the concrete industry and he's currently the IGG Director of Engineering and the ACPA Director of uh, Pavement Innovation. Just so you know what the topic I'm supposed to be talking about is concrete pavement life extension, okay? But I'm gonna weave in a lot of things. So the other thing you're gonna see, I've purposely got some old slides in here. I've been around, but you're gonna see some old stuff and I'm, I'm putting that in there on purpose because on the preservation side, there's a lot more progress that should be made than we have. And I'm not being critical of anybody because these are the guys who have screwed up more than everybody. This is a Dave Geiger definition on pavement preservation. I think it was vintage 1995, something like that. And I've underlined important points and I'll, I'll address those, but you know, this is what we all like to get warm and fuzzy about, you know, the right something, the right this, and, and we need to move past that. So that was being done probably 30 years ago, that same slogan or, or variations of it. And you can see we always wrap in safety and all that. So um, as we go forward, like I said, these are some of the things that Dave had. Pavement life extension, there's absolutely no question. That's one of the most important things we need to know. And it's one of the least we know an answer for. And it did, you know, Scott, if you're still there, I mean, he showed some data, somebody else out there did. And I, I'm really proud of you because that's what's been lacking for 30 or 40 years. I think the FHWA movement with performance measures, although it's probably counterproductive to pavement preservation, as long as you run two systems, what I'm seeing from the outside is we're seeing agencies start to invest more in data collection and, and getting the stuff that you should get after. So, and then improve safety and customer satisfaction. It's a, it's this process must be accomplished. Long term, like I said, these are out of his definition, 1995. Integrated cost effective. So we're finally getting around to that. You know, there's states that have done it very well. There are states that haven't, have been my experience. Okay, but this is the, the panacea for all of us, treatment life versus pavement life. We could have almost that same discussion today as we did 30 years ago. And this will be some of my message on what I call the data-rich environment. And the real question is, does it extend the life? That's a really hard question to answer. And I haven't been very good at doing any of that stuff. And if you can't answer these, then how do you know if it's cost effective? And again, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm just trying to show what um, are a, big, a big part of our issues. So what do you mean by safety? If you ever want from an outsider, you know, particularly in this, if you ever want to make a state uncomfortable, ask for friction data. Okay, you know, what weather accidents, all this stuff, everyone starts getting real nervous and rightly so. But then how do we address safety? This is another really old graph and it really looks dramatic, right? Well, what if we use modern data? <laughs> this is all safety data. So if I look at uh, billions of miles of vehicle travel, man, we're doing really good. If I, you know, even rated um, total accidents, we're still doing really good. But the fact of the matter, in my opinion, the big accident reductions we've seen have come from the automobiles, not from the roads. And that probably is where it should be, because if you look at what causes accidents, it's the driver, right? It's not our roads. And so the things we ought to be looking at is, are there things that we need to worry about on, on the roadside, maybe a little bit better, and have those a little bit more open. For customer satisfaction, I don't know anything about better than ride in my whole career. Be real honest with you, I honestly don't think the public knows if it's asphalt or concrete. They don't even know if it's smooth, but they really know when it's rough. And so all you're on the end of, you can do a really good job, but you never hear about it, you only hear about the complaints. I'm not telling you things you don't know. By the way, that's where the California photograph spec. Effective life cycle costs. None of us will know if it's truly effective unless we can do life cycle costs. Again, these are just my opinions. Um, and these are all the things that uh, Guyber had in his memo that um, answers all those questions. That's a sonic boom in case you're wondering what that happens. Imagine trying to catch one of those as you're flying through the air. The other message I'm gonna leave you, this is, I hijacked this from Gary Hicks and it says draft on it because it, it was just in a draft stage. And this is what we all learn. This is what's taught in school, what we all believe. And we have all these definitions and I'd argue that for conceptually, that's a really good model. But I think to, for concrete payments, you're gonna have to look at a different curve and not just one curve. I think that's one of the things we need to start talking about. I don't worry about definitions because to me, the pavement doesn't care what you call it. We get into this funding categories and that kind of clouds a lot of discussion. So I try and just so you know, I push all those away and say, what, what would I do to the pavement if I, if I were a pavement and wanted help? What you're seeing right here is the oldest concrete pavement in the United States. It's Bell Fountain, Ohio, and it's 125 years old. So where does that fit in this curve right here? And that's my problem. Um, am I still in the preservation mode or my reconstruction? 
It's just a darn old pavement, and it served very well. It was also the second pavement built in the United States, concrete pavement. So the question is, could we do that today? And I don't think we could. And that ought to be something from my industry side we should think about a lot more. Now, one of my daughters loved The Lion King, and I watched way too much of it. So I call this the circle of life, and I'll use that term. But if you go back to the Hudson House, the original pavement management book, this is the concept they told you, and this is what we forgot about. We get into these curves and stuff, and you saw that in the last presentation, and I, I, I'm glad to see it, but you start out with design, you go in your materials and specs, your quality construction, the environment, the loading, and then your monitoring. This is where pavement preservation begins on concrete pavement. In an ideal world, I don't ever want to have to touch it. I want to be able to build it and it lasts forever. Well, that isn't real, but that ought to be our goal. So you need to have this closed loop that's always feeding back to telling you how to tweak your design, your materials, or improve your construction. And so in your pavement management systems, um, that's what I'm hoping people see. Now we're going to get a little closer to what you want to talk about, and that's really what, what's the practice. Historically, on the interstate, what I've observed is people drive them into the ground, and then they go out and they call it preservation or rehabilitation, restoration. Question is, what, what are the triggers that we should have? And we need a little bit more information on that. You know, obviously, where concrete was used is the heavy loads. It serves well. And if you don't believe it, um, this graph right here, California just had a, uh, well, actually, it was last year, on I-10, it was diamond ground for the fourth time, and it was 70 years old. So they got their money out of it. So it, it can be done, but the question is, what if we did it better? This is actually that Bell Fountain uh, pavement. It doesn't look shiny, but at 125 years old. And the thing here, I mentioned they use concrete on heavy loads. The oldest pavements I'm aware of are the ones that were done on local streets. So the question is, is there you know, something to think different about that? What we really want to do is get in here and fix them before they're broke, and that is not how concrete pavements, it is broke, and then you figure out, based on the stress, what to do. What we ought to be trying to figure out is how to manage the deterioration rate, and I think that was also spoke about today. And like I said, we can get into discussions on the right treatment, right pavement, right time, but then the minute you say, well, what's your deterioration rate to answer those questions, then it gets really quiet and those are things that we need to probably do a better job on. So these are all the reasons. Um, I know everyone wants to get out of here, you can see those, but probably beat you up enough. This is a report that Dave did. I'm going to try and show you um, one of the issues in the industry that we've all participated in over the years. And again, I'm just reminding you on this one, this is what we define additional life. So this is what that study is showing and notice they've done a really good job on the treatment lives and Dave recognize that you know pavement life is different than treatment life okay and that that's one of the issues now look at some of these numbers because they're going to correlate well with what I show you later but I'm explain why these things always correlate well at least in my opinion so here's this was uh, this is a shotgun blast if you can see the different colors the uh, pink dots are dowelled concrete pavement the blue or black whatever you want to call it are undowelled so if you grow up in the Midwest and get educated there, every concrete pavement has to be dialed and has to have dials all the way across. If you grew up in the West, we didn't use steel. So, but if you look at this scatter plot, they're all over the place. So what I try and get, this is a time axis down here and this is the rate of uh, deterioration up here. If you're down here, you notice you've got both colors. You should be looking at your data with your sections and figuring out what it is. There's more than one way to skin a cat. On the concrete side, we always do one size fits all, and I don't think that's a good design approach. So that's one of our limitations. This is a plot from Mike Darter, and this is really hard data to come by. What these are is different uh, in the study they were doing. This is probably the 90s also. Um, the, this is the state routes. What he's showing here is this color um, is showing you the design life and easels for the original pavement. This yellow color is showing you how many easels it had at the time it was diamond ground. The blue is showing you how many easels it had at the time of the study. It didn't mean the life it ended, it's just how many easels it had. So for the Florida site, you can see they, there was either something wrong or somebody said we want to do a preemptive strike. They ground it very early, but again, it lasted longer than it's supposed to. But on all these other ones, you can see that many of them, they were ground after the actual design life for the pavement. And I think this was 1993 Asho Design Guide, if I recall. 
but these kind of plots are really hard to come by. The best data I've seen outside of this is uh, Washington. The, the message I want to leave here is compared to a lot of the systems, you know, California just put in an amazing system, payment management system, Texas did it. Washington, as I understand it, probably has one of the more legacy systems, yet I still think their data is better because that's really what it's about is the data, not the system. You want a good system, I'm not knocking that at all, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily limit you. Again, one of the things on safety, historically we always talked about stopping distance. That probably doesn't have a lot of relevance to accidents anymore because they're not rear end accidents uh, predominantly, so I'll leave that alone. <coughs> We're getting closer to the end and closer to what I'm supposed to be talking about. These are the different treatments that you typically see for diamond grinding. I always say it's seven. I've got more than that up there, but diamond grinding, diamond grooving, partial and full depth repair, dial bar retrofit. And how many people here were at the peer exchange? We saw Jeff do the, one of the best presentations I've ever seen on dial bar retrofit. Okay, you're lucky. We'll talk about that a little bit more also. Joint sealing and resealing, slab stabilization, replacement, longitudinal crack sticking, and buried treasure. And buried treasure is in the old days when the economics were different, if you had a concrete pavement that had a friction issue or a noise issue, it overlay it. So now the economics are a little bit different, and if you have a pavement that has, is very good shape structurally, but only had functional issues, we take off the AC and diamond grind it and turn it back into concrete pavement. So that's one of the things. These are just, I'm going to walk you through in case you haven't seen any of these strategies. Obviously, this is diamond grinding. The issue on diamond grinding is what to do with a slurry. Some states allow shoulder disposal, some don't. Full depth repair. The rule of thumb that you'll hear everybody say is if you have... 10% uh, or more slab replacement, you should reconstruct the road. There are states that replace every single joint, and it's more cost effective than rebuilding it. So don't get into the rules of thumb. Look at your own economics, what's going on. Notice on this one right here, they're replacing a ton of slabs. I'm not sure that one would have been economic, but like I said, their economics should determine what to do. Partial depth, this is probably the more difficult of the um, concrete pavement preservation and the highest variability. Construction quality is everything on this one, and I'll show you some results on this to show you what I'm talking about. Dalbar retrofit, you'll see ranges of service life of 10 to 15 years, and I'll show you a bit in here in a little bit. And Jeff had some that at, are at 26 years and still going, so we're going to have to resurvey on some of these results to figure out what, what the expected lives on some of these are. Cross stitching, um, one of the other messages I should leave on this, except for partial depth, I believe concrete repairs should be permanent repairs, just so you know, and I'm going to try and explain that a little bit more, but this is one of those that, like, if I do a full depth repair, my goal should be both on an industry side and agency is you never replace that slab again. We're not there, but we should be, and we ought to be designing things to try and figure out how to get there. Same way with cross-stitching, that should be a permanent re repair. We shouldn't be seeing things only go four, five, six years. We have the technology and abilities to do better. Slab stabilization, you can see here it was a level up and that came out pretty good. This one was a residential neighborhood. But again, this is one of those ones that's somewhat close, it's like partial depth. If you don't have the right people, it may not work just like what you hope, so. Joint crack sealing, we'll get into this a little bit on, on the surveys I'm gonna show you. This is also one of the biggest. In my whole career, this has been, if you really wanna get half the room mad at the other half, ask about do you believe in sealing concrete pavements or not. So somehow we need to come to an answer with that, but it's been going on a long, long time. So this is a buried treasure. This was actually a New Jersey project, but this is what I'm talking about, buried treasure. This was an SMA. They ground it off of the grinder at the same time they milled it. This was a seven mile project that was average age of 60 years old when they re-exposed the concrete. So it can be done, it's still working. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out before I get into performance curves, and hopefully you can see them, as you all know, you collect the data it takes a while to get it under contract, and then you go do the treatment. So the length of that window can be very quick. You know, you see some of them are up there one to two years, I think is a pretty good number, but notice you got some of them five to six years. So if your triggers are, well, let's wait till it breaks, you're quite a ways away from being able to do a, a, a good repair in, in a timely manner. So that's another thing I think needs to be talked about. These curves, what I'm going to show you, are a result of surveys. There's two different surveys. One was done by the FHWA Pavement Preservation ETG, and the other one was done by National Concrete Consortium. What this is is a cumulative distribution plot, and this is years right here. So the reason you show, or I show these, this would be your mean value. Say, so, okay, so 50% of the answers were this value 
or less. So that tells you that half the people were saying that Dalbar retrofit is uh, 15 years. Okay, so like I said, these kind of surveys need to be updated, but when I mentioned with Davis stuff, what we've taught everybody is just like in those reports. And then we survey those people, and they give us those same answers back. That's where these are. These are just people's opinions. That needs, that's why I'm talking about a data-rich environment. What we need to do is actually have the actual data and not, okay, you, you surveyed me again 10 years ago now. I've reconfirmed what I think, but that may not be what we know. But one of the ways you can use this as a state, if you're out here or everybody else, say, is out here and you're way back here, maybe you ought to look at your design or your specs or your construction quality. Why aren't you getting the same life that other people are? But, you know, that, so for me, this is one of the advantages of this type of uh, graph. Same way with full depth repair, you can see, again, there's quite a range. And like I said, these ranges pretty much are patterned off of what you see, like reports like Dave's and others. Now, this one is partial depth repair. And uh, what I should have pointed out, the blue is the National Concrete Consortium Survey, and the orange or brown, whatever you want to call that, is the FHWETG survey, and it was pavement management engineers who we surveyed. What I tried to show, and I don't think you can see it, but you've got, I picked a few states and put the range. Because also remember, means don't tell you much. Um, for example, the range of, I'll just call it out Nevada, was one to 10 years. Well, average life of five looks good in a, in a result, but it's meaningless if you're the owner, because if I've got something that's only lasting a year, I wouldn't do it, and I don't think any of you would. So how do you, how do you fix that? But you could look at those kind of things and decide that there's something going on here we need to figure out. This one absolutely stunned me that these two graphs almost laid on top of each other. I would have bet this would have had the biggest variability between the sur two surveys. And it actually had the least, so that, I, I can't explain it, that's just the way it came out. But diamond grinding, um, again, the biggest study historically was uh, Mike Darter, and it was, I think, 11 to 15 years average life. You know, this fits right in with this. Caldrans did the most current study and their average life was 17 years in their environment. So that's why I say it's real important to understand how it performs with your specs and your designs and your environment. Cross stitching, again, this is showing a long life, but I think this one's a little bit sketchy. There's not a lot of people who do that, but it ought to be a permanent, right? Once you do it, you shouldn't have to worry about how long it lasts. It should last as long as the rest of the pavement. Joint crack sealing, again, this is kind of falling in where it nor normal ranges people talk about. So if you want some good references, the, FH, the EDC4 Everyday Counts program by the FHWA is updating all the checklists, both asphalt and concrete side. They're also on the concrete side, the EDC4 that has providing some contractor training. In my opinion, that's the best training on concrete preservation that's ever been done. And it's also intended for inspectors, but it'll get into some detail that inspectors don't need to know, but it's actually, I think it's the best there is. The, the best manual, is the CP Tech Center. Again, that was an FHWA sponsored project. And the FHWA also did some uh, best practices. Missouri DOT was actually the contractor for it. And again, that was a Mike Darger thing. So I have a question for you guys, and then you can leave. It seemed, you know, one of the problems come up here talking, you guys pick the, the topics, and then I try and fit in what I really want to talk about. But it, I struggle with it, because we can always talk about, here's the treatments, but you got to get, be getting tired of, there's only seven of them, right? So I can talk a little bit about a lot of them, a lot about one of them, but would case studies be of more interest to you guys? So just think about that. It's hard for us, because we'd have to go to the owner to get them to say why they did what they did, and then try and get some pictures, but I've always enjoyed case studies as a learning mechanism. So as you guys leave here, or, you know, feel comfortable with it, just, just let me know. With that, I'm done. So if you've got any questions, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Wait, 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 there might be a question. Going back to specifics, you had that thing on partial depth repair. And uh, Wyoming's not here, so I'm just gonna speak about some of the stuff I've driven through in Wyoming, and they don't like to do that at all. They've had tremendous success with your diamond grinding. They've got, I think still five, maybe it's four sections now, because one I think just got uh, uh, an overlay with uh, bituminous. But they've got five sections they did with diamond grinding. Have you gotten results back? How many states across the country that have seen this, because you went one to 10 years with diamond grinding, have you gotten any results? No, that was uh, partial depth. That was partial depth. Yeah. Years. Okay. 
Well, with the diamond grinding, have you gotten the results back on what the longevity of that expected life extension is? Some, some summary of all the states, because I'm sure it's going to be different for each state. What I said, I'm trying to get you, that that's the graph right there. So you're looking at about 12 years. The national study that was done, again, probably in the 90s, was, I, I'm going from my memory, 11 to 15 years. Caltrans did the most recent study, and in Caltrans roads, the life of the treatment, what they did is said, okay, the roughness level at the time of grinding, how long did it take to get back to that roughness level? The average was 17 years. See, the other one was Midwest, so you've got all the, you know, environmental conditions and, you know, everything is different, so. I had uh, a couple just ideas to throw out your uh, question about the case studies. I, I do think that'd be good, uh, especially because five years from now, half the people in this room might not be here and they'll have a new group and they're trying to take care of old concrete pavements that were built before they were born. So we're a state that uses C, uh, CRCP. Um, just a couple of things that <clears throat> we have to start thinking about. We traditionally have used a lot of mag chloride to keep our roads clear of ice. We're starting to use salt in locations. We got rebar in our roads. What can we do to keep that rebar uh, from, you know, from that's already there, uh, preserved? Other things to think about are shoulders. We've got asphalt shoulders on some of our concrete roads. Should we bother to, to do anything to those to keep them from deteriorating and then harming perhaps the, you know, the, the edge support? Those are all the, those things we think about. What we, I think about, and that's preservation. We might want to you know, have a chat about some of those things. I don't know what the other states are doing on those types of things. Let me add a little gas to the fire here. I, I would deal with Jason on the corrosion, but one of the things, the, the long-term pavement performance, SPS2, which was a new concrete construction, um, you guys don't have one in Oregon, but California built, there was 14 states that built 12 test sections, all identical. They had five different design features. You had thickness, flexural strength, drained and undrained, lane width, and base type, okay? What they allowed was either asphalt or concrete shoulders and untied. So that's not part of, that's a cofactor in the experiment. I would bet today you can tell the difference in the performance between the two. So I, you understand I'm, I'm death on AC shoulders, but a lot of people use them around the country and almost half of those SPS2s have asphalt shoulders. But that's a data rich environment. You know, they're like 25 years old, so you should go out there and be able to mine that. Nobody is, but the data is there, it's on InfoPave. So those kind of questions I think could be answered. Because for even for my state did a concrete shoulder, but again, there's no tie bars. That, you know, I think that was a huge mistake. But um, so for rehab or preservation, what you want to call it, that'd be one of my recommendations to tie shoulders. 80 to 90 percent. This guy did one of the case. Anybody doesn't know this because it was so long ago. I'm not sure it was even in English. Um, but one of the best studies ever done on moisture intrusion was done by this guy right here, in Barksdale, right? Yeah, yeah. 80, I think you were 80% of the water comes in the longitudinal shoulder joint. Minnesota said 80 to 90%. Roger Olson did that study. So by allowing that to settle and open up, you have to be creating erosion at the base on concrete pavements. There's just no way that can happen otherwise, I think. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.